his, uh, his grace in action. When I first met him, I realized as a part of his volunteer mentor team was the FBI agent that locked him up, the U.S. attorney that prosecuted him, and the judge that sentenced him. They were all sitting around smiling as a part of his team. John, would you just speak briefly about what are the technique you use to get these officers and, uh, re uh, and people returning from prison together, remember, coming out of the academy? What are some of the techniques you use? Right. Well, there's a, there's a couple of things uh, that we do. And I first, uh, first I want to start off by saying that, you know, a few years ago, several years ago, I, I, I sat down with the members of the police department, uh, a guy named Kevin McMahill, who is our undersheriff, and uh, Chris Petko uh, at the time, who was over gangs. And we, we were having a conversation about, you know, how can we uh, get law enforcement more involved? Because, you know, I hear the sheriff in the community saying, you know, can't arrest their way out of problems, and they wanted to have the boots on the ground. So we started talking about how we'd be able to do that. And we sat around for a couple of three months and kind of writing down some different ideas. and. And then all of a sudden one day we said, you know, let's tear this up and let's get in and, and start getting, uh, getting involved. And the police have been involved ever since that day. One of the things that we've done that has caused such a, uh, has been such a home run for us is that we work with the police officers that are coming directly out of the police academy. They're, 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 they're coming right out of the police academy. This is before they get their, get their boots on the ground to begin the work. We invite them into a room full of people who are just coming home from prison. And they come in without their uniforms on. <laughs> so they sit down at the table and they spend that entire time with people who just come home from prison and something very magical happens in that moment. It's life rubbing up against life. No one in the room knows that they're police officers <laughs> except for Chris Petko and I. But I can tell you the level of transformation that takes place during that time. And then at the end of that process, uh, a week later, then those officers walk in the door <laughs> in their full, their full uniform. And again, it's changing the lenses of, on both sides of the equation. We want, we want people on both sides of the equation to begin to look at folks to see them for who they are. You know, police officers, you know, policing is an occupation. That's what they do. But that's not who they are. And when we can get people from this segment of the population begin to view them as mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and sisters and brothers, I believe that that relationship um, begins to connect. Okay. One, and, and one other thing, Bob, the, 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 the challenge that we see across this country where the disconnect between police officers and law enforcement comes from this. There's, there's been this lack of trust for police officers across this country. And the reason why there is no trust is because people do not have a relationship with those who are upholding the law. And the only way that relationship will ever be developed just like in any relationship is that life has to rub up against life in a spirit of complete transparency. So in that transparency, police officers will be able to show that they're just human beings like everyone else. So out of that transparency comes the relationship, and from that relationships, it builds up trust. Good. Any questions? Uh, good job. Absolutely, 100%. If you're ever going to make, if you're going to make the decision to, to improve the caliber of how you live your life, education has to be a part of that. So when we find the individuals coming home from the system that they don't have their GID, GED, the number one thing we want to do is show, express the importance of having that. And once we can get them to make that mind shift, mind shift and see that that's important, this is why it's so important to make sure that we partner with our educators, our school teachers, our professors, to then come alongside them and tutor them in that capacity. And when, once they achieve their GED, they're not going to stop there. We want to make sure that we can get them enrolled into college and see what we can help them to do to pursue a higher education. Okay. Yes, sir. When, when you saw some of the incidents that have occurred across the United States in the last couple of years that led to significant um, levels of violence in the community, protests, both good and bad, uh, you know, and, and, and in the, in, with police, there's a big difference between protesting and burning down your city. Um, one is lawful, one is not. Uh, and the police, it's our, oblig it's our duty and our responsibility to ensure that every person that wants to protest lawfully has the ability to do that. 
But having said that, one of the things that I've learned in, in the last short few years is that the police department's ability to maintain law and order within a, in a community is 100% based upon how well that relationship is with the community. And we have done um, a yeoman's job, I believe, in maintaining a, a better relationship with our community than, than maybe some other cities have. It's not to knock another city or to say that we're better or worse than anybody else. I just think that we have taken a specific um, marching stance when it comes to building that and bridging that gap between law enforcement and the community that we serve. And I'll give you one good example of this. Our sheriff has a council called the Multicultural Council. And once a month he meets with prominent members of every demographic of the community, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, uh, the gay community, everybody's in the room. They have conversations that have to do with our policy on our department. If we're gonna, inst like when we instituted a new social media policy about what cops can and can't do on social media, they had, they had the right to review that policy and they actually gave input. Now ultimately the sheriff makes the decision but they got to provide input. So much input that they have within that, within that council that we now have civilians sitting on our or hiring oral boards for police officer. Now they're not the entire board. We obviously have police officers sitting on that board because there's certain things that we're looking for that a cop has the ability to ask those types of questions. But those civilians get to see a little bit of the insight into what we hire and how we hire and ultimately what we hire. Because of those relationships, after Ferguson, after the issues in Dallas, New York, down in the south, we have not had one act of violence toward a police officer that stemmed from any of those incidents. And I think it's 100% because we have a, a pretty good relationship with the community that we serve. Next question, uh, right here, yes. Well, thank you so much for, for your question. I think we can answer uh, all of the questions in this. And we have been doing some things, uh, working. There's a piece of legislation up in the state of Nevada right now specifically for Ban the Box. And there's been some conversations over the years uh, regarding that. But our approach to that is, you know, what happens if they never ban the box? And uh, what we do to help folks find employment uh, is something remarkable. But again, it's the stuff that takes place in the community. Some people ask, well, how in the world have you been able to get 70 plus percent of the people, you know, full time employed? And we, it's simple. We don't believe in job placement. We believe in job partnerships. We <laughs> partner with employers in the community. We want employers to know that, listen, you're not just hiring John and Jane Doe, the returning citizen that's coming back <laughs> to the community. You're hiring an entire army of people that are gonna be dedicated with them over the next 18 months to make sure that when they get inside the workplace, they are going to be soaring like a superstar. Because remember, our goal is to change the face of reentry. And the only way we're gonna be able to do that is to help to create a society of people who come home from the system that get inside the workplaces, inside of a community, and not only do they never reoffend again, they're in their living levels of life that most people only dream of. It is key to the partnerships uh, that, that we have. The mentoring plays a huge component of that. And as a result of that, right now at this moment, inside the state of Nevada, Hope for Prisons are sitting on more jobs right now than we can fill. And these are not minimum wage jobs. The, the, the reason why they are here is because four, five, six years ago when we started out on our journey, we helped to produce some people that got inside the workplace and they are performing at their maximum potential to the, we're to the point now where employers are coming back three, four, five years later saying, can I have five or six more of those? We just partnered with Stations Casinos, which is one of the largest um, um, uh, uh, owned casino, local casinos, 15,000 positions. Station Casinos has hired everyone uh, that we had sent over. They have 2,000 positions open at any given time, but it's the partnerships with the employers, bring them in on the phone, uh, bring them in on the fold, and, and let them know that you're just not hiring somebody you know, by themselves. We're there to help them. One of the things that, uh, that you're talking about is inspiring people. The best antidote to disrespect is performance. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you're, that's why as, a, as, a, as a footnote, 
Andre and, and we are, uh, every, every young person should see hidden figures. Oh, God. oh yes. Great. That should be a required movie. Uh, we are raising funds, this is a commercial now, <laughs> to send all of our kids our boundless free zone, Karen yeah. and Andre, to the movies. We're talking to the owners of the studio to see if we can't rent a movie. Hidden Figures is a historic movie everyone should see, particularly young black kids, oh, yeah. because it shows you the power of performance over protest. Yeah. So... Right now, we, we see about uh, 350 people uh, uh, per year. Um, but if you, if, you take, if you look at it on, 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 the, on, the, uh, on the big scale of things, you know, even at the 350 people a year, we're, we're just scratching the surface. You know, each year in the state of Nevada, we have 6,000 men and women returning to the, uh, Nevada uh, from the Nevada Department of Corrections. Our state uh, is probably one of the only states in the, in the country. We release half of our entire population every year. 12,500 folks in, uh, release 6,000. From the, on the federal side, 696 will return from the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and, and 200 people a day get released from the Clark County Detention Center. And so again, with the 350 that we're working with, you know, we're just you know, scratching the surface. This is why it's so important that we partner with some other folks in the community that are uh, doing you know, uh, relatively good work as well. Yes, um, it, it is very, very important, and I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, you know, on our advisory board, uh, we have folks, we have the Lieutenant Governor Mark Hutchison, who sits on the advisory board. Also on the advisory board is the district attorney. On our advisory board is the head of corrections. On our advisory board is the head of parole and probation. It is imperative that you get everyone in the community involved in every spectrum of the work. We have the head of social services that is you know, on that advisory board. We want to bring, we have to, you have to bring everybody uh, to the table and listen to this word, unprecedented unity in order for us to be effective. And if you think about it, and I don't have time to unpack this, but this is that new wineskin. The problem that we've had in reentry since forever is that we were, we were, the Bible says you cannot take new wine and pour it into old wineskin. Right, you cannot take new wine and pour it into old wineskin. And that's been the problem we've had in reentry. We were taking all these fresh ideas and we were pouring it into an old antiquated system called the community. So in order for us to be able to change that, we had to create a new wineskin to take all these fresh ideas to be able to pour it into. But what makes up the fabric of, those, of that new wineskin is everybody in the community from the top all the way down, working together, literally on one accord. Now, to address the folks uh, that are coming out, we, you know, we have about uh, 200 plus people that are of the faith community that go into uh, the system, and they are working with people on the way out. So our, the state of Nevada DOC has changed some of those policies that it would only make sense that if a, a person is going in and he's on a weekly basis, you know, mentoring, discipling, developing those relationships with them, that he needs to do a warm handoff right into the community. And it, it is a, an extreme benefit for that person to still be engaged with them because he started on that journey and help them to see it through. And I think that that is what, uh, that, you know, is gonna lead to them being successful. And I think it's been incremental that we've got the people that we have here um, and I think some of the others will come next time uh, because of what you all have experienced here. Uh, yes. Our community-oriented policing program has evolved exponentially over the years. We started out with one squad of people who were basically voluntold to go do this particular function and nobody knew what it was we were supposed to be doing. And while we did have some initial success, it certainly isn't up to what it is we now know today as being a standard. Uh, one of the things that we have done with regards to your question is we've gone through to some of the neighborhoods that are distressed and we will establish a temporary 
substation, if you will, to where we have folks that if they're not in there full time, they do have representation there on just about every watch. So that if folks within that community need assistance or they need information or anything along those lines, they simply go down to where those officers work. This has really had a twofold benefit because number one, it, it does establish that air of trust and help propagate it throughout the particular community, but it also gives the officers ownership of the locales where they're at. They get to know everybody, they get to know people's families, and it really helps when it comes to the tome of relationships that Bob Woodson brought up. That the relationships, as you would well know, are key when it comes to community engagement.